From your favorite dietitian, everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. Hello, and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. This next episode, I interview Dr. Robert Kochko, who if you've been listening to the podcast or you follow me on social media or you're a personal friend in my life, then you know that unfortunately I have been experiencing a slew of health issues. I found out that I had Epstein-Barr, um, but I was still feel, not feeling like myself. I was told there's nothing I can do about it. And if you know me, I'm an action taker. You can't tell me there's nothing I can do. <laughs> I'm going to heal myself and I'm going to figure out how to do it. So as a result, I actually went to see another doctor and that brought me to Dr. Kochko, who is a naturopathic diet, uh, naturopathic doctor and licensed acupuncturist. And no, I didn't do acupuncture. I'm deathly afraid of needles. However, he advised it. And we talked about that in the episode of how acupuncture can be helpful. But he is an amazing human being. He's involved in so many different um, areas and he's an advocate for healthcare reform and he's a leader in the field of naturopathic and integrative medicine. And he really does a really awesome job at looking at the person as a whole and helping them find solutions to, if not able to find the root cause, at least manage their situation in a better way. And the topic we talk about today is chronic pain. And you're going to learn a lot. I know I definitely did. And it's a really, really interesting take on how to deal with chronic pain outside of maybe taking Advil or Tylenol or, you know, even stronger medications like opioids, which we get into at the very end. So you definitely want to listen to it all the way through. You are going to learn so much. So without further ado, here's the interview with Dr. Robert Kochko. Enjoy. Hi, Dr. Costco. How are you? Hey, Tony. How are you? It's good to it's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm so excited. I already in the intro told everyone how I know you, and they're already super excited to hear from you. So, thank you for yeah, being yeah, yeah. It's an absolute pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, obviously, I would love for you to just start by introducing yourself, saying who you are, what you do, and most importantly, why you do what you do. Sure. Oh, that's a long question. How much time do we have? So I, yeah. <laughs> I guess um, I tend to put my professional life, since that's most of what we're talking about here, into three buckets. The first being clinical practice, because without clinical practice, none of the other projects that I'm working on are uh, really feasible and, and, and certainly not authentic. So I work um, in the New York City office at Inner Source Health. Um, our practice is right across the street from Penn Station at 30th and 7th. Uh, most of my practice is focused on cardiometabolic risk reduction, lifestyle medicine type stuff, um, and then also a large subset of chronic pain, which I think we're going to be talking about today. Um, and then always, you know, the general stuff, everyone we're working on hormones and, and everyone we're working on nutrients and things like that. And so that's always essential. Um, bucket number two is advocacy work. I am um, incoming president for the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. So our, our, association that represents all naturopathic physicians all over the country, making sure that we have a seat at the table, both on the federal level, but also that we have um, really strong support and advocacy on the state level um, for things like licensure and, and scope expansion and things like that. Um, and then finally, for the last couple of years, I've been working on a healthcare technology startup. You know, one thing I found with clinical practice is as much as the one-on-one the -on -one work sort of fills my heart and, and, and brings joy and, and is really fulfilling, I found that um, if I want to really have a, a large impact, much like uh, a successful podcast, um, if I want to have a large impact, I want to reach a larger audience. And so um, the company is called Tribe RX. We're essentially um, developing a psychosocial augment to biopsychosocial pain care so that healthcare providers can help their patients who are dealing with chronic pain and then eventually other types of chronic disease um, to feel better supported, better understood from the perspective that that'll actually drive behavioral change um, in a really strong way. And again, I think we'll be talking a little bit about that on this podcast. 
The why, the why is again, a little bit of a long story, but I guess the short of it is, you know, one thing that I find for myself as a naturopathic doctor, I'm also a licensed acupuncturist is most people who go into this world. Um, I think it's much the same for people who end up working in the world of nutrition. Um, what happens is they see the value for themselves or for someone they love, and then that expands from there. Right. And so uh, my experience is much the same. I was an EMT in high school. I had uh, an arrhythmia cardiologist had no answer for me and, and actually a what we'll call an alternative medicine provider though he was very well educated and well credentialed i'm actually helping and a couple months later we went back and they said well that's good you know you haven't fainted yet um and there's really n- no way to explain the fact that you're feeling better but you are so that's great and so that just piqued my interest i had been interested in medicine um but finding naturopathic medicine was really powerful for me because it combined uh, this opportunity to see the body in a different way. And certainly I was reading way too many, you know, medical anthropology books at that time to understand different approaches to the human body. But what it also allowed me to do is, is see that I can spend time with patients. You know, when I was an EMT, the, the common theme was keep people alive, get them to the hospital, but you never really hear their story. You never see what brought them to, to that moment in time. Certainly if it's a car accident, that's not the case, but if someone had a heart attack, there were predisposing factors that probably brought them there that exacerbated that. Um, and I was always really interested in people's stories and sort of the trajectory of their lives and the ecology of their lives around that acute condition. And so uh, with naturopathic medicine, I, I learned pretty quickly, we get to spend time with our patients. We, um, you know, a first visit with me is an hour and a half. Follow-up visits are, are typically about an hour. Um, and so that, that opportunity to connect and then see families and generations, you know, um, is really is really exciting for me, and that, that again, that's heart work that fills me much like the other work, sort of his brain work. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, and that that is so true for you. I mean, you know, I, I I think about it's very interesting because in the clinical setting as a dietitian, I felt very similar to that where I was helping people, but I wasn't. I I got fifteen minutes with the patient, and I would, it was more about the paperwork, right? And so it's not that you know, those in clinical settings can't help and they can, but there's, there's a different level where, like you said, like most people have a story Mm -hmm. and that story goes back like years and yeah, they come in with a heart attack, but we know it, that's like the icing on the cake for all the other lifestyle factors that they probably haven't developed that behavior that you're talking about. And by you allowing yourself to sit down with them to really understand why that is, I'll actually never forget when I was filling out the form uh, before coming to, to into your office, like, I mean, there was just so much stuff. And a lot of the, the things that I remember reading over was like a lot of the psychological questions that you would ask. And it was like really interesting to real, like I kind of started to recognize the correlations of like high stress situations and like my symptoms being worse. And, you know, it's kind of like, we know that, but the fact that you actually take the time to to understand that and to like help me see that, you know, I think that's really powerful. Yeah. That, that intake form in some ways makes our visit more efficient, but in other ways it really gets you thinking outside of the clinical setting and and it gets you sort of um, being more introspective about your life. One of the questions that I love that's been on our intake form for a long time is what do you love to do? And love is in, in capital letters and, and just getting people to think about that very often. They're like, well, no one has ever asked me what I actually enjoy doing. Right. And so most intake forms will have a section about stress and, you know, what are the, the challenges in your life? Well, we can counteract that with, with joy and, and embodied sense of, um, sense of being. And so, so just getting people to think about that and that mindset before they come in for the visit, um, just, just makes that conversation so much, so much more enjoyable yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, definitely. And I will say even the hour and a half went by so fast, like so, so fast. So and there's just, it's, it's crazy. But um, so, okay. So you mentioned it a little earlier and I definitely want to spend a majority of this podcast talking about chronic pain because I, it, when I even asked you to be on the podcast, I know you specialize in like a ton of different areas and you're so knowledgeable. Um, and that's the one that you said that, you know, would, would kind of, you would like to speak to. And it's interesting because my, my best friend, I'm in her wedding next year. I like cannot wait. Um, we've been best friends for years, but she's always had like this back pain and this, there's no, there's no reason. There's no source. We don't, we can't, she's gone to all the doctors trying to figure it out. And so I'm kind of curious for you. Um, like when it comes to chronic pain, 
and someone comes into your office and they're kind of saying that like they've been into all the doctors, there's no source, like what's your approach into helping them? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic. I think in the last couple of months, and especially with the work that we're doing with Tribe, um, it, it's sort of a, a primary focus to try to shift the conversation and the language we use around pain. One thing that I see over and over is people come in from their doctor and they, they've got this perception that their bodies are broken and that they need to be fixed by someone outside of themselves. And all the research pretty clearly states that if people feel um, higher levels of self-efficacy, if they feel like they can help themselves, their likelihood of getting out of pain beyond just making the choices they need to get out of pain and the actual likelihood of, of their perception of pain um, improves much more quickly if they feel like they can help themselves. So that's, that's my mission. That's why I'm sort of doing the rounds and, and trying to make sure that people feel empowered and, and feel, and feel like they understand that they can help themselves. How, how do they can uh, pain proof their bodies and their brains to be mm. better? And, and so the answer to your question is actually very much related to that. When it comes to pain care, certainly in, in many cases, there is a structural, often biomechanical cause, right? Someone's got a disc that's impinging on a nerve that does happen. However, and I see this in my practice because most people who come to see me have been to four or five doctors and haven't gotten the relief they need. So they end up seeing us as a last resort. Certainly we get people who want to be proactive about their health. And I love working on that as well. But most often it's people who just have nothing else, um, nowhere else to turn. And one thing that, uh, that we're seeing over and over is most of those people are coming in, much like your friend, and saying, look, they've done all the MRIs. They've done all the x-rays. All my doctors are saying there's nothing wrong with me. Well, there's two components to that. First of all, from a naturopathic, integrative, functional medicine standpoint, the, there's a possibility that we're going to look towards other types of testing, other types of lab work, other types of imaging that might actually fill out that biomechanical structural picture more. So that's the first area is, has there been enough to assess and understand if this patient is getting the care that they need? If we take that a step further, though, and take the assumption that, yeah, there's truly nothing on a structural level that's wrong, well, then we enter the world of biopsychosocial care. And so if you look at all the research in the last couple of decades, um, for some reason, there's been, a, there's been an um, inconsistency between what we know in the research and what's actually practiced in clinical care. So, so in the research, we know that to address chronic pain, we'll, we'll take back pain in a second, but to address chronic pain, um, you need to take a very comprehensive, holistic view of the body. And you need to understand that it's not just the physical body that we're addressing, but it's also a brain that's perceiving pain in the body. And so a biopsychosocial model does look at that biological, biomedical standpoint. But then beyond that, it looks at um, the perception that someone has around their pain. It looks at the, the environment within which their pain is being experienced. And so that's the psychosocial component. But then take that another step further in terms of being comprehensive. We have to look at things beyond this classic model. And I'll take the example of osteoarthritis because that's, that's a very common condition and back pain again we'll come to in a sec. When it comes to osteoarthritis, um, we've always thought that it's a, it's a wear and tear condition, that it's a non-inflammatory condition. What we're finding, though, is nothing in the body happens in isolation, of course, mm -hmm. and nothing is purely black and white, just inflammatory enough. So we always have this distinction, and it helps when you're in medical school to separate rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune inflammatory condition, from osteoarthritis, which isn't. But the reality is we have to treat inflammation in both cases. We have to look at the metabolism. People who have impaired blood sugar, who have insulin resistance, are at higher risk of developing osteoarthritis. And so we have to take that whole comprehensive perspective and not treat the joint that hurts, but treat the body that's got the joint that hurts to help the person be more resilient and less likely to experience the pain. When it comes to back pain in particular, first of all, back, low back pain is the most common reason people go to the doctor. Unfortunately, the tools that we've had are not all that successful. Um, there's even something called failed back surgery syndrome where people get back surgery. They're told, look at this MRI. There's a disc. This is what's causing your pain. Clearly, there's a, there's a surgical fix for something if it's a structural issue. But unfortunately, and the research evolves, but about a third of the people who get surgery for discs and back pain tend to feel better. 
about a third of the people tend to feel about the same and a third of people tend to feel worse. And so the question is, why is that? Mm. Your friend who, um, who's been dealing with pain and is told there's nothing wrong with her still has some factor that's causing her to experience pain, whether that's her genetics, and that certainly plays a role in everyone, whether that's um, the language that's been used around pain and the likelihood that she's experiencing um, some of the psychosocial factors that contribute to the pain, or whether she's inflamed or has that insulin resistance or has excessive ox oxidative stress, whatever might be going on. Um, the fact is that we have to look at those factors beyond just the disc. And the reason we have to do that is even in people who um, have disc issues, that's really a poor correlation to actually experience pain. And so in a sec, let's talk about how we separate the experience of pain from actual damage in the body. But um, if you look at low back pain again, and you separate out people who have pain and people who don't, if you take a bunch of imaging, a bunch of MRIs, the people who have no pain at all, and show those MRIs to radiologists who don't know that they have no pain at all, what ends up happening is by age 50, about 60% of people have some kind of degeneration of their discs. By age 50, about somewhere between 30 and 40% of people actually have disc herniation and something like 14% of people have slippage of their vertebrae that certainly in our minds would cause pain. The challenge is those radiologists would say, okay, yes, this person needs surgery probably, or this needs to be corrected because there's a structural cause. But in all these trials, the people had no pain at all, and the radiologists didn't know that. So we can't just look at that right. perception. Um, finally, when it comes to back pain, there's a lot to be said about ergonomics and posture and gait, but the way we move contributes in a very big way to our likelihood of experiencing back pain. The ergonomics story is a really powerful one, and it's a really sticky idea, but we can't um, assume that that's the only factor because when we look at um, office settings, so I think one of the largest studies that I've seen came out of Boeing. They surveyed all their employees with low back pain and they wanted to figure out what is the biggest contributor to their back pain. And most large corporate companies have ergonomics departments that are doing really great work. But what it turns out is that the biggest indicator of, of these thousands of employees, whether or not they had back pain, was uh, their their job satisfaction and how fulfilled they felt and what their their sense of purpose was in the work ergonomics aside posture aside where their screen is and where their uh, um their how their chair is positioned all that is important but it, it goes a step further so again that's a biopsy social model and so your friend who may not be getting relief um probably needs to step outside of that conventional structural model biomechanical model and to step out you know further out and look at that biopsychosocial care treat the whole person with back pain as opposed to treat back pain as a thing that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, until, and, and, the, and until the pain is completely gone, there's no quality of life, which is a whole nother aspect of uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and CBT, which are now being seen as the gold standard for, for treating even things like back pain. So I know I said a lot there. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, can, it, uh, we can tease that apart. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we can, we can dive into, but I think, it's in really interesting. Um, I guess the question is, say she, and whether it's my friend or anybody else, say they're experiencing back pain and what you're saying is they feel like they're truly happy in their life and they have purpose and they're, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, like just more, um, I guess happy with their life or whatever. You're saying that and they, the per, pe person that ha feels like they have purpose, their pain will be either less than or almost non-existent. Not necessarily. So there, there are lots of factors here. And I think that's a good place to talk about, well, you know, is there sort of a pain personality? Is there a likelihood that one person experiences pain and another doesn't? And, and there is. Research shows that there are three components to, um, you know, purpose aside and happiness aside and those classic measures aside to a person feeling like, they're going to be dealing with chronic pain long term. Factor number one is their likelihood to catastrophize their pain. So what that means is a um, person has low back pain and it means, oh, I'm never going to be able to work again. I'm never going to be able to play my favorite sport again, whatever it is. Right away, we go to this conclusion of a quality of life that's incongruent with what we want. Mm -hmm. Factor number two is that self-efficacy that I mentioned before, feeling like we can't help ourselves. We need someone else to fix us or help us. 
And so then when we don't take the steps necessary to change that. And then factor number three um, is, oh gosh, I'm blanking on factor number three right now. <laughs> um, the likelihood, oh, and how, how hyper vigilant they are to their pain. And so the way to, de to describe this is um, using some different language, sort of the difference between hurt and harm. Very often people feel like, you know, any movement they make is not only hurting, but it's actually causing additional harm. And then so we stop moving. Mm. One thing that, that really is a factor is people who are so hypervigilant to movement and pain that they stop moving. And that actually, in a paradoxical way, actually makes the pain worse. But back pain, again, one of the biggest indicators we have of likelihood of getting out of pain is how quickly people get back to normal and sometimes vigorous activity. And I know you're very into fitness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that concept will make sense to you. The quicker we can get back people back to normal mechanics and normal movement, the less likelihood they have of being in pain. Someone who's hypervigilant is always on guard. And anytime they're always on guard, that increases inflammation and increases sympathetic tone. It, it turns their nervous system and primes their nervous system um, to be one that's more likely to experience pain. Um, and that segues very well into this other aspect. So your question was, well, this person's generally happy. They feel fulfilled in their lives. They've got great relationships and all those things. The reality is some people's brains are primed to experience pain more uh, more readily. And so it literally, it's like an amplifier is turned up and the same perception, um, the same stimulus of someone, you know, someone stubs their toe is experienced differently. And so we have to um, help that brain feel safer and to perceive pain um, in a less extreme way. So all the other sort of classic aspects, the person isn't depressed and they're not anxious and they, they feel like, again, they have purpose and, and they're doing important work and they, they feel supported in their lives. But it's certainly possible that based on the way they were taught to think about their pain as children, based on what they saw in their family members or in their loved ones, or based on genetics, their brain is more likely to experience pain, all else equal. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways we, we can describe this is um, I use the example of, of knee pain. I had uh, ACL reconstruction, gosh, I don't know, 18 months ago now. And I, I dove into the research on knee pain and what it is that causes people to have chronic knee pain versus acute knee pain. And one of the things that was staggering that came out is if you look at imaging, if you, again, show radiologists a bunch of images, 40% of people who look like they're bone on bone, it looks like there's no cartilage at all, they should be in pain, have no pain at all. Wow. Whereas about 15% of people who uh, looks like on the imaging they should have no pain have um, some kind of significant chronic knee pain. And so the, what are the factors that contribute to people experiencing that? Again, these are brains that are amplified to experience pain differently. And so in addition to all those biopsychosocial factors we talked about, we have to also help that person feel safer in their body, safer in their movement perceptions in their body. And truly from that perspective, movement is medicine. You know, one thing that we find is that um, at some point I, I use the example of someone who's got chronic neck pain because it makes sense on turning your neck. Well, maybe they actually had a structural reason why when they turn their neck 26 degrees to the left, that causes pain. Our brains are smarter than us. Our brains are always adapting to the world that we exist in. And so it's possible that the brain is sending a signal to the body to say at 22 degrees, cause a little bit of pain to protect ourselves from going to 26 degrees and actually causing more damage. And that's protective. That's an alarm system that's meant to help us kind of like learning to put your hand on a stove as a kid. You're never going to do that again, right? It's an alarm si signal and it happens unconsciously. It happens very quickly. But when it comes to chronic pain, especially pain associated with poor movement, it's possible that the brain will learn that and that alarm system is getting turned on more often and for longer than it needs to be. And so, again, the person turns their head 22 degree, degrees to the left. That causes a little pain. They, they go to 20. They go to 18. And the patient comes in. They say, Doc, I can't turn my head at all. It really hurts when I turn it in either direction. Mm. That's become a chronic issue. And a brain that's, again, been amplified and that has learned to experience pain differently. So any doctor that you work with, if you deal with chronic pain, needs to understand this model and can't just look at the muscle, can't just look at the joint, can't just look at the, the vertebrae or the disc. We have to look at the totality of a person's experience. That's really, really great. So I'm writing some notes because I don't want to forget to ask you this. So I guess the, the, the bigger question is, it's, it's, we were saying is that some of us experience pain more than others. In general, 
our perception of pain can actually make that pain worse or better, I guess, Mm -hmm. technically the way you perceive it. I guess my question is, and I I feel like this is me helping my friend out for free. (laughs) (laughs) Because I know her very well. And she's, she's a nurse. So like she understands a lot of the mechanisms of the body. And, you know, she's, there's like the one side of her that's accepted that this is part of her in the sense of like, okay, she's uncomfortable, but she chooses to move. And yes, she could definitely improve her sleep and her nutrition and all those things. But, um, you know, for the most part, she's kind of just accepted it as this is what it is. Um, and so she kind of goes about her day and she stays active and she does the best she can. But at the same time, she still kind of also finds herself still going to doctor and still trying to figure out like what's the root source, you know, because I guess my, my concern would be, um, like, and you know, me personally too, like with my situation going on with my health, it's like, there's an acceptance of like, okay, this is how things are. But then there's also like, but am I ignoring the fact that there could be something else underlying going on? And so like, how do you, um, how would, how would you help someone who like, what, how do you, what do you think is the best approach? Like acceptance and then also search for a root cause or is it likely with pain that maybe there is no root cause or even if there is, as long as you perceive it a different way, it's fine. Does that make sense? That's, that's a, Totally. That's a great question. I think there's like four key points there, although probably more. Um, Let's see if I can remember all of them. So first of all, one thing that happens when we have this conversation, when we talk about this psychosocial approach and the fact that your perception is very different and that there's an amplifier in the brain that's turned up for pain, one thing that that can sound like is what patients often hear when they go to the doctor, especially with chronic pain conditions like fibromyalgia, and chronic uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which is your pain's all in your head and you're probably depressed. That's absolutely never the case. Yeah, and, and I will say, because when I was experiencing pain before I knew that it was related to the Epstein-Barr or the mono and, or whatever was going on, I thought I, I was recommended to a rheumatologist and there was there was potential that I might have had fibromyalgia. Like that was one thing that they were telling me. And I, was, I didn't really know much about it. So I went in to look into it and... I was like, I'm not depressed. <laughs> like, right. I know. I'm like, the, and the fact that I was reading this, I was really upset. Like, I remember feeling like, how could these people are literally being told that their pain's in their head? Right. Like, which is like, it sounds, it, and it kind of also, you're right. Like, it kind of also sounds like that's kind of what you're saying, but I know it's not what you're saying. So I'm really happy that you said that because I would love to clarify that. Yeah. I remember reading that and being like, okay, it just means that they don't know yet. <laughs> like, it just means that, like, we don't really know what fibromyalgia is yet or the root cause yet, but that doesn't mean we have to tell people that it's all in your head and you're making it up. Right. Totally. So uh, so that that's certainly possible, is that we learn more every, you know, every year, every month about every chronic condition. And the research truly, you know, I think that the latest statistic is um, if healthcare knowledge used to double about every seven years, um, mm-hmm. now it's like, I think by 2020, there's saying it's going to be every three or four months. Not the amount of work that's truly it's changing. So it's possible we actually don't know, and and we have to stay on the cutting edge. That's always the case. Um, when I say that pain isn't always in your head, I should rephrase. When I say that pain is never just in your head, what that means is it's it's never something you're making up. It's very real, and you should never be felt be um, be made to feel like, um, what you're saying isn't valid, isn't valuable. And if you're going to a doctor who's brushing off your symptoms, very simply find a new doctor. That's just, that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. But what it does mean is that pain is never really experienced in the body. Yeah. We know that it's knee pain or back pain or shoulder pain, but the truth is the perception of pain doesn't come from the knee. We don't really have a lot of, you know, perception there. We have sensory nerves that come up to the brain and certainly those nerves can be affected, but the perception, the end result has to be processed in the brain. So pain is processed in the brain. And that's very important to understand is that um, anytime we're treating just a joint, even chiropractic adjustments, they have a role to play. But what we're finding interestingly is that those adjustments are actually activating certain brain areas differently. And so it's not necessarily just a joint but it's the signal that the body is sending to the brain. And so brain and body are always working together. They're always in concert here. Um, You mentioned 
the, your friend who, you know, needs to sleep potentially better and change her diet a little bit and all those kinds of things, who doesn't, right? Everyone has that. And so um, we know for all those individual factors, sleep and diet and, and the role of diet on microbiome and um, past traumatic history, we could we have separate podcasts on all these issues. The, the fact is all of them individually are both the cause and effect of, of chronic pain. And so someone who isn't sleeping is more likely to be in pain, mm -hmm. but also someone who's in pain is, is more likely to not sleep well. And that creates um, mm -hmm. sort of a vicious cycle with something like fibromyalgia. What we're finding is it's lack of REM sleep. That's very much correlated to all these things. Interesting. The other thing that you said was, well, your friend actually works in healthcare and is informed. And so this idea of self-efficacy of, of having the knowledge around your pain or that the, is the between pain, um, teach them some self management tools. Pain neuroscience education works much better than a lot of the, the pharmaceutical treatments we have. Again, pharmaceutical treatments have a role to play, but certainly just handing people an antidepressant saying you're depressed, that's what's causing your pain, is malpractice from my perspective. It's, it's mm -hmm. insufficient. Um, and, and certainly it leaves people feeling like, well, what the hell did I go to the doctor for? They didn't really listen to me because I have real pain. It's not just my depression. Maybe I'm depressed too. There's something else going on. Um, and then finally, you, you said something earlier about, you know, once they've accepted the pain and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, it, it, where's this balance between continuing to look for the root cause versus people, all, people often feel like when we talk about, when we have this conversation, you know, like, like we're telling them to give up and just accept their pain is what it is. The word acceptance is, is a really loaded word. And so um, I think that's worth exploring also since we're talking about the use of language here. You know, when we talk about acceptance, it's within the context of a whole uh, school of psychotherapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT for short or ACT, um, similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, which people are probably a little more familiar with. Um, but the whole approach and acceptance and commitment is not to say accept your pain, you're going to deal with pain for the rest of your life. What it does mean, though, is helping people to find new values within the context of their existing pain and to focus, to switch their focus on a quality of life with the existing pain. How do I get to the highest quality of life based on how I'm feeling right now aligned with those values as opposed to saying I can't have a quality of life until my pain is 100% gone, which is often the case, right? Right. This idea that we delay gratification, we say, well, you know, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to sleep better. I'm going to eat better just as soon as this back pain is gone. I just need, I need to, you know, go to do that. It is actually paradox makes pain worse. A focus on 100% elimination pain actually makes worse. And so, no, people shouldn't stop looking for the root cause. But what they should do is understand that. The likelihood that they're going to get better um, increases if, if there's more of a focus on quality of life right now, which again, paradoxically increases the likelihood that they're going to be 100% out of pain, right. which is a tricky idea, tricky thing to wrap your head around. Um, but it's, it's quite clear in the literature that that's the best approach. In parallel, keep going to doctors, look for the biomechanical cause, look for the structural cause, while again, remembering that the, the fix is coming from you and your body's ability to self-heal and not necessarily something that someone's going to do to you to take your pain away 100%. You have to be a part of the story. Mm, I love that. I love yeah. that so much. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to ask you about, because um, it's funny, you brought it up to me as, as a treatment, and I know it's what you do, but I'm terrified of needles, but I know you <laughs> <into> acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. um, and I would love to actually take a minute, to, if you could just explain what, like, what is acupuncture and why would someone go use it and how is it beneficial and go like just take the floor on that. Sure, sure. So first, before we talk about the mechanisms and how it probably works, and again, acupuncture is one of those things that we're still learning every month and every year. Um, let's just, just establish the fact that it works. So the largest trial, the lar largest one I know of is, was in the Journal of American Medical Association, not some small journal, did a meta-analysis and systematic review of all the available trials and pretty clearly um, confirms that acupuncture not only works, but works beyond placebo. That's always the sort of the gold standard. It's always what we're, um, what we're comparing to. And 
with acupuncture research, it's interesting in that placebo in theory would be putting an acupuncture needle in the wrong point and seeing if putting it in the right point actually makes a difference. That's a little bit of a flawed concept. And the acupuncture community would say, well, that doesn't actually make sense because there are certain points based on what are called assure points based on sort of where it hurts. And, and we know all about trigger points and all that. And so even doing a placebo controlled trial in acupuncture is difficult, but with that difficulty, um, there's something called sham acupuncture where people actually think a needle is being inserted, but it's not. It's clear and evident that um, acupuncture works and that the results are sustained. I think the longest studies are about a year out from treatment. And so that's one thing. Thing. Often people experience acupuncture, they feel relaxed, they feel better, and their pain comes back a few days later. And that certainly does happen. That's where I would say all those other naturopathic integrative functional therapies actually make all this stuff more effective. And, and using acupuncture within the psychosocial model is certainly more effective. In terms of how it works from a, from a more Eastern perspective, which in, in our world we would say a little bit more of an esoteric perspective, in, in Chinese medicine and most East Asian medical practices, um, there's this concept that pain comes from obstructed flow of qi. Qi, we can have a whole other podcast about, <laughs> but it's an obstruct, obstructed flow of, of energy of some sort. Um, and in Chinese medicine, we talk about qi or blood stagnation. And so the goal with choosing the acupuncture points, once you've done a thorough intake and understood what's called a pattern of disharmony, understood what it is that's contributed to, to the person's life in a very nonlinear way. So they look at digestion and sleep and um, past trauma and diet all within the context of my shoulder hurts, right? So it's never just that. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole goal with choosing the acupuncture points is, is to improve that flow. From a Western perspective, what we know is that acupuncture literally changes the brain regions, the ones we were familiar with, the, the somatosensory cortex, which is where we experience our pain, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is related to our likelihood to suffer from pain or our need to fix something and do something for ourselves, the anterior insula, which is related to our feeling of safety. It's almost like our internal thermostat, our feeling of, of whether our body's being harmed. All these areas that are important in chronic pain are actually changed with acupuncture based on the on brain imaging studies. We also know that acupuncture increases endogenous endorphins. So everyone knows about opioids. Opioids have created a whole mess in our society. And finally, there's, there's awareness. And I'd say in some ways we're overcorrecting for that. But our body has an ability to produce its own opioids to reduce our pain signals. And so acupuncture actually increases those opioids, the, the production of those endogenous opioids. Very interesting. Um, Acupuncture is also very helpful in improving circulation to certain areas, in reducing um, muscle spasm, which a lot of chronic pain conditions cause tension and muscle uh, spasm. And there's a whole school of thought around that and TMS and things like that. Um, and then I'd say the last thing, and this is sort of the newest research that we're finding, is that our bodies are electric beings in a very real way. And so what, what we're finding around the acupuncture points, and amazingly, in the same points that were mapped out thousands of years ago, we're finding, um, if we map out the body today, decreased electrical resistance. And so we're putting a, a stainless steel needle into a point with decreased electrical resistance. How that's impacting electric bodies that are impact that, that are sort of on a quantum level Right, but but the research shows that there's some correlation to that. Um, so I'm excited to see where that where that goes in the future. But um, I, I think the, the short answer is it works. The long answer is we definitely need to know more, and especially to get it more mainstream and to get insurance companies to cover it more readily, and all those other things, and to get it into hospitals. There's there's emergency departments now that are offering acupuncture and seeing that they're prescribing less opioids in, in acute situations. So the right. sky's the limit. Um, all the research we can gather will actually make that all more feasible. Right. Um, so we're going to learn a lot more in the next five and 10 years. I, I really hope so. I really do. I, I do, I, you know, I mean, it's a whole other issue and topic and, you know, our healthcare system is screwed up. Like we, we know this, so it's not, it's not a secret. Um, so it would be really exciting to see more naturopathic doctors, acupuncturists, like non-traditional forms of medicine 
in hospital settings. I think that would be amazing. And I, I hope that it's happening at a faster rate than it is perceived to be, but um, it would be, it would be really great. It really would. Yeah, and yeah. On a federal level, we're working on that. One of the, I guess one of the bottlenecks is that right now, you, if you have Medicare as your primary insurance, you can't go see an ND. And in and, and most states, Medicaid also doesn't cover that or just medicine. general insurance. General right? insurance, not in New York. Um, in other states, we're sort of full designation where insurance companies are mandated to cover us. And we're working on that in different states until we can get that full across the board insurance coverage. It's really hard for hospitals to figure out what to do with us. But yeah. the more forward thinking clinics um, have integrated medicine departments and, and they're having an opportunity to spend time. What that requires though, is totally flipping the script and changing the model um, within which we treat patients. So this idea of group visits is really interesting and shared medical appointments, which is something that we're actually doing with tribe. Um, there's, there's a lot of avenues to go down, but the, 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 sort of least common denominator needs to be doctors and time patients. If that happens, everyone wins. Doctors are less stressed. Hospital systems maybe make a little bit less money. Insurance companies maybe make a little bit less money. Uh, but the fact is we need to change the, the structure within which care happens before we can expect better care, I think I would say. Right, right, exactly. Wow. All right. Well, I could literally talk to you all day. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, like, is there anything that you didn't say or talk about that you feel like you really want to make sure the listeners get out of this before yeah. I ask them where they can find you? <laughs> sure, sure. So I, th I think um, I'll sort of use this opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing with Tribe. Yeah. Um, so TribeRx.com, essentially a prescription um, for psychosocial support for patient connection um, based on this idea that when people feel lonely or isolated across the board, whether we're looking at heart disease or cancer or Alzheimer's, the likelihood of dealing with those chronic diseases goes up if we don't feel supported and heard in our lives. And, and, and unfortunately, it's as dangerous to feel lonely as it is to smoke 15 days to feel lonely to be obese. And so we've got this mission of helping healthcare um, and the healthcare system and healthcare providers to, to offer that kind of support in a way that not only makes people feel better supported, but also helps them make the behavioral changes they need that we know actually reduce the likelihood of chronic disease, whether that be dietary changes or improvements in sleep or exercise, right? And so our program is essentially a, a prescription that any doctor can offer their patients for psychosocial support where we connect people who are dealing with a certain condition with others that we call peer coaches, others with lived experience of chronic pain. So someone who's been there before and who's gone through this experience to say, hey, I've been there. I know what you're going through, which just that alone makes a huge difference. Let's make these changes together. And then they're also connected with a tribe of other people, other people who are going to the same experience. Research shows that makes people get better much more quickly. And so um, the goal is to, to make that readily available safe, systematic, reliable, to use technology in a way that, that fosters human connection as opposed to being the end-all, be-all where people just connect on an app, right? That's not our goal. Is TribeRx something that people can utilize right now or is it in the stages of being made? So uh, thank you for asking. So we've been sort of in stealth mode where we've been running uh, groups and tribes. And, and interestingly, we mentioned this idea of opioids. We're, we're offering programs um, in a sort of super hyper local environment where we can also offer support for opioid addiction, uh, where we can get people the referrals they need as we launch on a more national scale. Um, that's not necessarily feasible. And so that more national launch is imminent. What I suggest people do is, um, is go to tribe rx, t r i b e r x dot com, um, and, and put in a request just to stay on our, on our newsletter list. And we'll be absolutely sure to, to keep you apprised. Um, and we've got some really exciting partnerships that are coming up too as a, as a launch to healthcare providers. Yeah. So um, it's imminent. Yeah. And it's so needed. I actually didn't even put the connection together. And now that you're saying it, it's so true. Like the amount of people, the amount of people who get addicted to drugs as a result of pain or an accident or something, it's a real problem. And I like almost that was, wasn't even on my mind. When we said we were going to talk about chronic pain, like, 
that didn't wasn't even a thought in my mind but it is that is like the most amazing thing and I really hope that it's something that like you said could be utilized throughout the country and even outside the country like yeah yeah we're we're working on it I appreciate that you know it's it's a it's a problem when we talk about the opioid crisis that requires a lot of solutions. We're not the only solution, right. no, but of course. in that moment where the doctor is concerned for, for concerned to prescribe for their patient, we know peer support mitigates addiction risk. And so just that alone, um, they can feel safer to prescribe because the other thing I mentioned earlier that we're sort of overcorrecting with things right now, what's happening is doctors are for afraid to prescribe opioids and patients who've been on them for 20 years, their body has changed to be dependent on these things, mm. not necessarily addicted though. Sometimes that's the case, but dependent and then they're losing access. And so both sides of the coin are a problem. People who need them for quality of life are losing access and also people who were prescribed them unnecessarily in two large doses and now are addicted. And so we're somewhere in the middle where we're, we're trying to help, Patients get access when it's appropriate and safe, and also doctors to feel like they can prescribe safely. And importantly, if they want to wean someone off to do so in a way that's voluntary and with buy-in from the patient and at a pace that's safe. Right. Involuntary weans that are too fast, never been shown to be effective, never been shown to work, and they're very dangerous because people end up on the streets going to pick up heroin or whatever it else you know, that they need because these are strong medications. These are oh, strong drugs. It's a um, so. real problem. It's, I, yeah. Unfortunately, I've seen it in my part, like with friends. It's really, really is. So thank you for what you do for real. For, yeah. and, and it's it, it's just really, I love that you're also, you know, an advocate for this nationwide in other ways. And I just, yeah, you're really, really special. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I feel the same, Tony. Same yeah. about you. Um, but so, all right, anything else before I kind of tell people, we could say where people find, can people, bleh, until I can ask you where people can find you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, th- I think I've said enough for today. There's always more to talk about. We might have to yeah, have well, another one about sleep and nutrition and pain. Yeah, no, I would love to actually, I mean, cause you, I mean, I would love to have you back for real. Um, and we could talk more about just, I mean, there's just so many things to talk about. Yeah. You know, um, so I would love to have you, have you back, but in the meantime, uh, where can people find you? Sure. So the practice, um, we have locations in Huntington, Long Island and in the Manhattan office. I'm only in the Manhattan office and we do have some presence out in Connecticut. Um, but, uh, mostly you can find me at, um, innersourcehealth.com. So www.innersourcehealth.com. Or uh, my other website is drkachko, D-R-K-A-C-H-K-O.com. It's all the information about practice and articles. And we've got a really active blog and newsletter. Feel free to sign up and follow us there. Um, I mentioned Tribe. So T-R-I-B-E-R-X.com is, is the healthcare technology startup. And then if you're interested in learning more about naturopathic medicine and the work that we're doing, if you're listening in New York, you can go to nyanp.org. That's the New York Association. And um, our national association is naturopathic.org, N-A-T-U-R-O-P-A-T-H-I-C. <laughs> um, so, I put so, it all in the show notes. So it's yeah, and, and if anyone has any questions, um, they can feel free to reach out to me directly. If you send an email to info at drkochko.com, it'll all be there for you. Perfect. All right, Dr. Kochko, thank you again so much. I really appreciate your time. And I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Wow, is that not another amazing episode? I seriously love these interviews. I'm learning so much every single week. I hope you are too. If you are, please screenshot the episode, share it on your story, tag me, tag Dr. Kochko. Let us know that this was helpful to you and brought you some value. If you know someone who could benefit from listening to this episode, please send it their way. And if you're not already subscribed to the Tips with Tony podcast, you definitely want to subscribe. A new episode comes out every Monday and every Wednesday. And when you subscribe, you'll be the first to know so you don't miss a beat. As always, thank you so much for listening. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time.